And before I start, let me thank uh, Stephen, Steve Fan, Steve Van with a V, Stephen J, Stephen R, Karen and Theodora, uh, both of you for your long support. Hugely appreciate it. Carolyn A and David D, DR. Um, thank, just, just, no, no, this is really appreciated. So today, um, uh, David D.O., uh, I don't know why I don't write your whole names down here. I probably used to even. <laughs> David, uh, uh, David says, I'm curious to learn about observing and painting the penumbra in color, both where darkness turns into light and where light turns into darkness. Do you have any thoughts on this? You know, I would predicate anything, any kind of a conversation around things like penumbra, names like that, highlights, things like that, with a, with a, use your eyes, and make observations. Um, but uh, one thing I would like, uh, David, or others who do these kinds of questions, is push, dig a little deeper so I know exactly where you want me to go with this. Uh, in any case, I'm going to simply show you some Boston School paintings and talk about the uh, penumbra. Uh, remembering that the, the, shall we say, the trick of impressionist painting is to not have names like that. It's it's fine to notice, you know, if you know there's such a thing as a penumbra, but if you, as long as you don't think uh, that somehow or other knowing there's such a thing as a penumbra is going to have you doing anything differently from what you would otherwise do, which is hitting the right color, the right value in the right place. So keep in mind, all the time that what we're really talking about is is um, that. And then, yeah, and it's much like anatomy or uh, perspective. Um, when you see that the perspective is off, so knowing perspective would help you to observe when you're in error, potentially, might, or knowing anatomy might. Uh, so using it as a reference, you know, to say when you're off um, is uh, is great, but to try to get this stuff to look right, especially color movements in places like uh, the penumbra, uh, really tried to drop that kind of a thinking because of all that it contained. One of the first things Gamble ever said to me was, uh, you have to drop your presumptions and your assumptions. Uh, and we are full of them. And uh, lots of them have words, have titles like penumbra. So, uh, but nevertheless, we both know what we're talking about. So let's just look at some pictures. It's always for me a very important thing to say to mention that. So the, this one, this is this is Joseph de Camp, and um, it, so everything on that wall is what we call, or significantly, what we call penumbra. Something like the darks that you see me pointing at here and here might be pure shadows. This half zone is what I think of as penumbra. So partial partial shadow, and it has to do with the big window, and. Uh, when the lights come from around both sides of this, if the window's big enough, if it's not a, if it's not a pin light, you know what I mean, uh, you'll get uh, this secondary shadow, and um, the secondary shadow will frequently be uh, informed with a different color, but it will definitely be a different value, right? Because there's some light getting in over there. If you closed off parts of this light, this thing would look dark. If you close off some of the light nearer to us on that big window, it would go the other way. You know, this would this would tend to to disappear. This part would tend to disappear. So I think I've said that the way it works. <laughs> so um, again, the question is observation. So if you're looking at the uh, uh, shadows at any time, you're talking about especially something on a wall. We're talking about the movement. Of values, the gradation of values. So when you're doing that, you need to know what your lightest light is. Let's say in this area back here, probably the lightest light is right here. Everything can then, in, the, in that zone, which, and this should be corrected to all the other stuff out here, but everything in this zone needs to be related. You need to know what your darkest dark is, potentially here and here, and your lightest light. And everybody we know is landing between those two things. Now, this is where, if you'd ask the question more specifically, if you were saying, how do I do that with paint? Uh, in some way, that would be useful. Uh, but I'm just describing to you that 
that the content of this area and how you're going to get your lightest light and darkest darks to travel. Now, what happens in, sh in shadows, penumbra, is that certain places on the shadow read better. That is, they make more distinctive shapes. And other parts tend to be very much more lost. <laughs> I'm going to sneeze in a second, I think. Mm. Uh, so you can see these passages here are more lost. So one of the things I do, I'm doing whenever I'm painting penumbra is noticing where there's the reading part and where there's the lost, just drifting part. And in each of these cases, it's a question of speed, you know, how fast this moves from being the darkest dark to being part of the midtone or lights. And that zone there that reads is a giveaway. The second part of that, of course, is that these zones are frequently different in color. And the best way to think about that is, or to, to observe those colors, is to look at them when you're out of the corner of your eye, look at them, be aware of the whole, and you'll notice that there's certain parts of these shadows will be different in color. When they are, it's just up to you to adjust them until they begin to take on the, re the relationships uh, coloristically to all the rest of the stuff in the picture. So if you have a yellow down here, shall we say, and another one, something like a yellow here, you'll see there may be a set of what we call the yellows, maybe even some stuff in here. And those things are to be regulated, related uh, to each other. So that's what I'll say. This is just relational observation, right? So what you really have in penumbra is you just have degrees of, yep, yep, you have values getting darker and darker and darker and then drifting away. And at some point, all along these shadows, some, some of the, and this is what Da Vinci called sfumato too. Well, he's talking about this passage along here, right? Where you can see this midtone. The midtones in general form what, what he thought of as a smoky or a fume, like, like smoky uh, transition, right? It's very hard to fathom, too hard to see. Yet in all these passages, there'll be one part or two, like here or down here, that'll read better, and there'll be some parts that'll be virtually lost, that so you can't find the, you can't find a, tr a real solid uh, transition edge that you can draw with. So um, let's just look at other pictures. Maybe other things will occur to me to say. Um, but the one thing I, I should, well, yeah, I should say this, as long as I'm standing, standing here and sort of trying to cover all the territory initially, uh, these guys are putting these notes down and they're trying to put them down and leaving them. So the adjustments they're making, it isn't blending. Now, in the case of Paxson, it tends to look a little more like blending, but we'll talk about that when we get to Paxson. But it's not, it's not blending to smooth out the surface, even though the area looks um, uh, uh, smooth. The wall may look very smooth. They, they're trying to keep their color alive. So to be able to do that, you really have to use the palette well. Whatever the last value was you put down, you have to mix the next one next to it so you can see it and see what it'll do into that next color. And then the fusion of the strokes is a real thing. You don't try to not fuse strokes. Um, and that just means you're not making square edged marks because that will tend to, uh, I mean, even if the values are perfect, there'll be a tendency of that to look you know, mosaic-like in a way that seems less than true. So let's look at the second one. This is Joseph de Camp's second one. This is the one you can see in the Museum of Fine Arts. And here I'm not so much talking about um, uh, the penumbra as much as movement of shadows on the wall, but it's similar stuff. So if this is darker here, it would be because the window's coming in here and therefore that would be some sort of right midtone, right? Some lit, less than the, lit, the most lit part of the wall. And so there's this whole big drift over here and these drifts not infrequently have color movements in them. So your job is just to, to get those values going and then find the color movements within the value movement, okay? Um, this is quite a spectacular picture, um, coloristically, to see it in person is something you all ought to do. Well, speaking of seeing in person, we, uh, the uh, Gamel, uh, the Guild of Boston Artists is having a show of Gamel students, so it includes a couple of Gamel paintings and then some of mine, some of uh, Tom Donnelly's and all the other guys that were associated with Gamel over the years, or many of the guys are also members of the Guild of Boston Artists. So, um, if, you, if you're in Boston, uh, I do recommend you get over there and have a look. Uh, look at my stuff in person so you can see if I'm a bad man and you're listening to a Pied Piper. <laughs> yeah. So, this is Starbell. And of course, you can see all the shadows, the pools of shadow. Here's a pool of shadow. So everything along this edge here that isn't, isn't solidly contrasty, so pure shadow, in other words, 
is um, is what we call penumbra. And so up in here you can see those half tones. The shadow, you'll notice, and this is characteristic of, of shadows, is that the closer the shadow is to the figure from the light source, light source coming this way, the closer the shadow is to the figure, the sharper edged it's going to be. And you'll see that same thing is happening rather here. These are sharper edged, more sudden, the contrast is more sudden, there's less penumbra, there's less fatness of the penumbra, right? But there's not much more to say about it than that if to whatever degree this, oh, there is a passage here that's just shadows, pure shadow, somewhere along here. And then at some point, the, the light is getting in from both sides a little bit and it weakens this whole thing and hence the shadow begins to get lighter. That's just factual stuff. Copy what you see, get the color notes right, get these, like a note like this right to all the darkest dark, uh, the lightest light, get these notes right and then and then uh, make the transitions right. Get their effects right in the neighborhood and make these effects right to other effects. And then you're set up and the rest of it becomes movement of value. And that movement, movement of value simply has color in it as well. Um, now one thing I can mention to you, um, uh, David, was is that on this spot like this, you said, you said something about the color on this side and the color on this side. Um, that's a real thing, of course. These are different values and they're very plausibly different colors because this has much more of the ambient light, which is the, the light of the room. And this area has much more of the direct light. You can see the coldness of it here. And so there's definitely gonna be two different colors on the floor, it, pl plausibly, not always, or not, not, you know, not, not by much frequently, but. And what I find is that there's going to be a fat middle tone here that's more striking than another place. And I tend to put that in, just if this is what you're asking, I tend to set that in there as a series of marks as its own thing. I'm not taking this and dragging it over here and gradually lightening it. I'm jumping over and finding the note that reads. Uh, if this was the darkest dark of this, I would jump over to here and find this color note right here. And I would use that. Now, if I'm trying to find the one right where this joint meets this one, I would do that as well. I would jump down there and say, "What color?" I try to find out what color that is when I'm looking at all the other colors in the area. If there's a color difference right there, I want it. If there's a value difference and you don't get it, you're gonna have a harder time seeing the color difference, okay? And by the way, if you see color in the shadows and you don't get the color quality, in other words, it doesn't show its color, it's harder to improve the color if you can't quite see it, right? So make sure you get all the color in these shadows. And by the way, Jazz, I appreciated your comment about the uh, about how much fun it is to paint the shadows out of paint, you know, uh, it, there's no end of it. Um, especially as you start getting them to be rich enough to produce the atmospheric qualities. So you can see other penumbra along here too. See the mid-tones here, soft, that soft stuff. The shadow, the shadow actually ends, you can see rather along probably here and everything else after that is penumbra. And it typically has some drift in it. Not infrequently, it may even have an, a sudden ending edge. Well, we'll look at some other ones. Let's look at uh, uh, Paxton. Now you see, it's uh, sort of a classic thing, right? So here's this hard reading thing. This, the pure shadow is probably going up into here somewhere. But you can see that what we do is when we work visually, we're not trying to find the shadow, we're trying to find the reading edge, the one that reads the most. And we're just trying to put those points, uh, those joints, those places where two values meet. We're trying to get their contrasts right to other contrasts and their relative uh, presence visually is what delivers that. You know, the, when you feel this contrast here and you look at all the rest of this and you don't see a contrast that does this anywhere else in here, that's, that's your leading contrast in that whole mass, right? So that's one of those things that directs the traffic. And again, as you can see, when, the, when, the, where the, when you're nearest to the light with the shadow, you're gonna have the most uh, abrupt uh, joint, and, and you'll see it just drifts and wanders away, getting soggier and soggier and weaker as it goes and finally just fuses into nothing. It's the same here, you can see the shadow part here. This is not a simple shadow of the object. This is a altered shadow because there's light coming light coming in from both sides of the object, creating that. So it's a distorted uh, shape. But as you can see here, he's these edges are, are, are um, with, you know the idea of chiaroscuro, that's the idea, part of that is the idea of, of obscure in the shadows. Part of that is that the edges aren't as sharp in the shadows. And there's an example where you can see that. So this is an edge, but it doesn't have a sharp edge joint like this and like this. Now, I can tell you these things, but you need to start painting in the, 
you know, the, by, the, by the effects and include, when you do contrast, the quality of the edge. And before you'll know it, you'll understand with your own, with your own uh, uh, lights, with your own uh, grasp. Try not to be painting out of somebody else's book. Um, I'm only telling you what's visually true, right? What's visually there. What's, tr what's true in pictures is you have values. It's the only thing that makes it possible to see anything in a picture. And uh, they have, these values meet from time to time and make silhouettes or various, they make shapes, they make joints in any case. And if you can get those color values right and do what happens at the joint, let's look at a spot like this. If you can get this value right and this value right and, and manage this edge here, you should have the um, game in hand. That's, you know, you, you could reduce it to that. That's the conversation of Joseph de Camp and the others when they say put down, um, it's just the right color, the right value in the right place. Um, and then something about drawing, well, that's, I would limit, I would use the same kind of word we're using, not drawing, I would say edge, joint, that dark meets light and makes a silhouette, if you want to call it that. So that's a thing uh, that's different from, uh, you know, a broad word like drawing, which you may have in your mind full of all sorts of other things, like now we're drawing the what? Even on this area here, the, the, um, you could call this midtone here penumbra. I mean, it does produce form because there's less and less light. So the power light's over here somewhere and there's gradually less and less of that light. But we typically call these middle tones. We don't call those penumbra. So technically the penumbra is, is a, as I said before, it's a shadow that would be there like this. It would be there if you didn't have the light on that side and the light toward us was all you had. If you, you best, best leave it at that, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Such a thing as over explaining something simple. Um, yeah, these are more examples of penumbra. Yeah, and I wish I knew exactly what you were looking for. Here's a wonderful example of color shifts. So there's a value, the penumbra value with its different color. And then uh, you can see that the relative edges are made. So this one actually m maybe has a slightly greater presence than that one. And all of which are relative to compared to other, you know, high contrast areas. High, you know, sharp edged high contrast areas. But you can see the, what he means by that. So one of the things I'm talking about is find this note down the middle, hit that note down there, hit the note out here, make sure you know what those are and that they make sense together. And then you can begin a process of finding the notes that are landing in between. And, and of course, with all the gradations that happen, uh, as you said, a second note in here and a third, you might find yourself having, you know, multiple, uh, 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 additional uh, tones uh, for some for some distance over and over until you finally have the feeling of that the suddenness of the speed of that movement from a flat note till it finally goes out here and shifts suddenly into the light. So I don't know. Uh, this this isn't really supposed to be a big long video because it's you see how simple in theory at least it is. So here again, there's the penumbra. I don't know what I can say to you. You see that this is redder here though than over here. This has more of a green. It's got some red in it. I mean, every area is red, yellow, and blue. So you got your job really when you're painting is to make sure you get, you go through red, yellow, and blue in every area and do it in a relation. And you can't be wrong in your notes. That is to say in your, in your color relations, right? But um, not, not talking about value movements now. We're just talking about color. So if you see, if, you, if, you're, if you're aware of, of that, uh, you'll be able to get closer in your movement, say from here, gradually to this. The other thing I recommend you doing though, is you set a note here, jump over and set a note here, or jump in between them and set a note here and try to use your imagination to see if those three color notes are right. These, this is all part of that discussion, if you follow what I'm saying. But it's the discussion about getting every note, you know, every note's rather done that way, in the way we work. All right, I'm probably gonna getting hopelessly redundant here. So uh, this I'm showing you, this is my, my painting, the uh, thing I call old hat. And what you're seeing down here in the cast shadows, you're seeing that same thing. I'm showing you the suddenness of the edges here then gradually fusing, diffusing as it gets further and further away from, the, from that absolute uh, where, where immediately leaves the object. Um, I didn't paint that out of a book though. I paint in the order of things that read. And so I'm painting certain things at certain times because of their visual order. And then I'm, um, 
and then I'm painting, then finally when the, the visual order meaning of this contrast say here to this one or to other ones, and to or to other ones, and then to uh, when you get into that subplot, you're down in an area now where you're comparing this to this and that sort of thing, but we're still painting by contrast plus edge, right? And then um, edge, edge really means the, the joint between a dark and a light, and the joint can be like a paper cut is a little bit like what you're seeing maybe along here. Not really, but sort of in that direction. And uh, I don't know if I have one truly like that in this picture. And then, um, yeah, the nearest thing maybe to it is over on the side here. And then uh, all the way up to these edges like this one here, which this is a this is a dark, it's a mid-tone, big, big note, big note, and then a soft mid-tone joint. And in, in the way you're describing it, that is in the world of penumbra. I can't imagine what else I would say about this. I've overextended it already, so uh, let me know if there's something I should dig into further or, or talk about it instead that you that we may have missed for you. So again, I want to thank the um, uh, the uh, donors of this of this uh, for this video today, uh, Stephen J, Stephen J, Stephen R, Karen O, Theodora D. And you too for your very long-lasting support. Really appreciated that. Caroline A. and David D. Um, and so again, thank you very much. Thank you all for uh, your time and attention and your sharing. We're we're really close to uh, ten thousand now. I think my I think Mr. Producer's got in his head that we're going to have a live one at ten thousand. So <laughs> if you want to encourage a couple of your friends, because this we sort of did this huge jump through the middle here, and now we're sort of going a little slower. So. Otherwise, um, we, <laughs> if that's his strategy, and I haven't actually, we had, we've had these discussions uh, speculatively, so I'm hoping we can do one of those live ones, though, uh, pretty soon. All right. Um, yeah, do get to see if you get a chance to go see the Guild of Boston Artists, 162 Newberry Street in Boston, and uh, have a look at some of Gamble's work and then uh, some of his students that are also members of that gallery. And you can see me there. You can see with, in my work, you can see this large, well, stuff you've probably already seen online, this very large uh, landscape, I mean, still life, uh, portrait, the um, violinist portrait, portrait of my daughter in pastel, uh, a very, very small still life, and then a uh, landscape, uh, which is one of the, which is, you know, <laughs> might be noticeable for its abbreviated, uh, form. I don't know if I spent six hours on that painting, and I'm not saying that to brag. I'm hoping it's effective when you see it. It's one of those, though, that because of that, not because of that, but but you may want to stand back a bit when you look at it. All right. Uh, thank you all again, and uh, have a great painting week.